So, do we think the end is near? Yes. We've been talking about that since last fall because things have been changing so rapidly. Not in my lifetime have I ever seen things coming together like the, they are now. And um, so, I don't want you to be too concerned about it because as I have said, things are not out of control. They're right on schedule. Absolutely. Satan's main tactic is to cause division, right? Absolutely. In First Timothy, I'm sorry, yeah, First Timothy 1 7, for God had not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's what God does. When God is present, he will <laughs> eliminate that fear. And the enemy tries to bring about confusion, 1 Corinthians 14, 33. So whenever there's confusion present, that's of the devil. That's not of God. So whatever characterizes what's going on in America and the world today, it is confusion and fear. So when God is at work with a group of people, there will be clarity and faith. There will not be confusion and fear. So what we see going on around us has people freaked out. I have to confess that I've had my moments in the middle of the night when I've been a bit freaked out. And faith has had to take over in those moments. Humans in the stock market do not like uncertainty. Here's everything you need to know. If you don't get anything else out of this message, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about the coming end of things, which for the believer isn't the end of things at all. Amen. The great reset is going to be the rapture of the church. But here's, here it is. Get this in your brain and you won't be freaked out. Looking unto Jesus in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, that is, not counting the shame a big deal, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. So as Jesus approached a very difficult, challenging, terrible time going to the cross, that was worse than whatever we're facing. Amen. Right? You know, none of us have endured blood so far like Jesus did. So the way Jesus faced challenge is the way, he's our example. Let's face this challenge that we got going on around us like he did for the joy that was set before him. Well, one of these days we're going to gain heaven. We're going to see what Jesus looks like. We got all kinds of good things coming. Amen. Keep your mind on that. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith that will take us there. So, we're going to look at a few hidden messages. They're in plain sight, but you might not have focused on them, and you need to do that. Because frankly, what we've got going on around us today is unprecedented. Amen. Now, I want you to think about that. We've talked a little bit about it. There has never been anything come on the earth like COVID-19. We had the Spanish flu, but the response was not the same, and the, and the takeover of power was not. What we've got going on around us today is unprecedented in the world. I don't know whether any of us have really let that sink in. We're living in unprecedented times. Amen. If we're close to the end, like we're pretty sure we are, we're living in exciting times. Amen. They could be scary if you don't know what prophecy says, but they are exciting if you know prophecy. So I want to give you some hidden messages, only they're really not hidden. They're just not focused on. So Genesis 6, Jesus says it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the day when the Son of Man comes. Right. So Noah and Lot are those two times. And in Noah's time, it says in Genesis 6, 5, that God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Now, I don't know whether I've ever committed a wickedness that was enough that God looked at what Doug Bradley was doing and said, that's a great wickedness. 
What we got going on in the world is a great wickedness like it was in Noah's day. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now that's what we focus on. We don't focus on verse 8 like we need to. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah went through a terrible time. He went through the angels, uh, the fallen angels, the sons of God and the daughters of men and the giants, the Nephilim and, and all of that. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And even greater than Noah, there was a guy who lived before Noah named Enoch. And the significant thing about Enoch was he was taken before the judgment came. A beautiful picture. So Noah would be an example of Israel and the remnant that will go through the tribulation, the judgment. But we have not been appointed to God's judgment. My judgment was back on the cross. Amen. I have no more need to worry about God's judgment. This world does. And the earth dwellers, as Revelation talks about them, the earth dwellers are going to have the judgment of God come on them. Not me. Not the church. Amen. Enoch is a beautiful picture of the church taken before the, the tribulation begins. So... Focus where we need to focus. We're getting ready to go out of here. Amen. Daniel, chapter 7. Much is revealed about the Antichrist, the Antichrist. And all that being revealed, notice the hidden message that we don't really focus on much. At the end of this, in Daniel 7, 26, it says, But the judgment shall sit. Now, what he's getting ready to reveal is God's going to judge that wickedness. Judgment's coming on the wicked. And that judgment will sit. Meaning, can you stop the judgment of God? Nobody can do anything to stop the judgment of God. That judgment on the wicked is coming. So, after all these things are revealed to Daniel that the Antichrist is going to do, God gives that word of encouragement. But the judgment shall sit. And they shall take away, this is talking about the Antichrist. You can take away the Antichrist's dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Nobody's getting away with anything. The Antichrist is going to pay. The earth dwellers are going to pay. The wickedness that's going on is going to be paid for. And that kingdom is going to be an everlasting kingdom that's going to be given to the saints. And all dominions shall serve and obey him. Hitherto, to the end of the matter. Now notice, as for me, Daniel says, my cogitations much troubled me. I don't know about you, but in these last months, my cogitations have troubled me. If you haven't worried about what's going on around you and then come to the place of faith, well, I don't think you're being honest. So we're not talking about immature Christians here. You know how this can turn out. Daniel had to process that. He was scared by what he was revealed to, what, what, what God showed him. It scared him. And it takes a while to process that and say, okay, some really bad things are coming, but God's still on his throne. Amen. Don't stop halfway. God's in control. Or you'll just have sleepless nights. This is the word from God to Daniel. Not the New York Times. It's the word from God to Daniel. His judgment's going to sit when it comes. Matthew 24, 6. More hidden messages in plain sight. Matthew 24, 6 is, of course, the chapter where Jesus is revealing to the disciples. They want to know what's going to be like at the end times. When all these things begin to come to pass. Jesus says, 
in verse 6. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. We're there. Yeah, clearly. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Now I want you to remember, he's talking to the disciples about the tribulation time. We're Christians who are living up to that tribulation time. And we're going to have troubles and problems, but nothing like they're going to have during the tribulation. The tribulation lasts seven years. Jesus said the second half of that, that seven years, the last three and a half years, were going to be the worst the world had ever seen. Brother Doug? Uh-huh. Well, the tribulation in the prophetic sense, the way that the prophecy of the Bible uses tribulation, is that seven-year period of Jacob's trouble. Prior to that, it's trouble, but not like Jacob's right. trouble. Right. Yeah. And the thing to remember, okay, so are we already into the tribulation? That's a question, a legitimate question. Are we already into the tribulation? Did we miss the rapture? Did we not get taken? Are we in the tribulation? <laughs> I'll just, I'll just give you one thing that settles it and nails it for you. In order for there to be a tribulation, there has to be an Antichrist. There's no Antichrist. So there's no tribulation un underway. Okay? There's a lot of Christians. In fact, there's been a real movement in the last two or three years. And it kind of goes along with the... Uh, the uh, Calvinism movement that's been going on in the convention, they, they derail Israel. They say Israel doesn't count anymore. And they poo-poo all this prophecy stuff that we're talking about for the most part. But Israel does matter. Absolutely. And Paul said they're going to be center stage again during the tribulation. And the church has always undergone persecution. And it's going to get worse. The church is already under... There was a, a teacher who resigned. Yeah. A young lady who resigned in front of the school board. Yeah. And she said, all this critical race theory... And, and so she had set through some training as a teacher that told her, if you're a white Christian American, wasn't that the combination? Yeah. White so, Christian. I got told I was a white female heterosexual Christian. Maybe that's what it was, something like If you're that, she was told in training, that has to stop. That power that you have has to go away. Turn the uh, air conditioner on, it sounded like it went off. It couldn't have. Is it? Okay. I can't hear. So all of this stuff is persecution that's going to come more and more on the believer. That's not tribulation. That's not the seven years tribulation. That's not, that's what God is going to do to this world. God's not going to do that to us. He always takes out, for example, Enoch, as I've mentioned, he always removes his believer before he brings the judgment on the ungodly. He doesn't bring his judgment on the believers. He brings it on the ungodly. Lot, Jesus said the other time, you want to know when things are going to look to the time of Lot. Noah and Lot. Well, what happened? You've got Lot who's taken out of the way just before judgment comes. The beautiful picture of how God... These are God's ways. He doesn't bring judgment on believers. He removes the believers out of the way and then he brings judgment on the ungodly. 2 Thessalonians 2.2, kind of the go-to passage about the Antichrist and the tribulation. 
Paul wrote that to them that they not be soon shaken in mind or troubled. So Paul wrote the words of the word to believers to encourage them that they didn't need to be troubled. You and I don't need to be troubled. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 tells us, for the mystery of iniquity, and that's where I want to camp out a little bit, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. And that's in Paul's day, so it's been working all along. The mystery of iniquity. And you'll notice that the for the mystery of iniquity doth already work until he, not it, but he, and you'll notice it's not a capital H, until he who now letteth will let. And the word letteth is a Greek word that means to hold down. Think of a police officer pursuing a bad guy, tackling him, holding him down. Okay, that's the picture. So there is a he who is now holding things down until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Here's how we know that we're not going to see the Antichrist. If you look at the previous verses, it kind of gives you the idea we're going to see the Antichrist and then we're going to be taken. But this verse 8 is what kind of nails it down that we're going to be taken and then the Antichrist is going to be revealed. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So the mystery of iniquity. Let's talk a bit about that. This world has been being set up for quite a while. The nations of the world are being prepared for that time when that man of sin will be revealed. It, it, it really can't happen without the preparation. The devil has been busy preparing the world to receive that wicked one. Amen. And I believe that COVID-19 and the response of the world to it, all of those things are preparations to accept that man of sin that would not have been accepted a couple of years ago. And this is where Amir Safati said, Safati said uh, just in the last few days, and, and so he's, a, he's a Messianic Jew from Israel, and he has a worldwide perspective that I don't have. Okay? He said that the trust in governments to protect and manage things like conflict, war, pandemics, is dwindling. He said that not just in America, so is, the, is the trust in our government in America dwindling? Okay, like never before. I've always known the government was the problem, it was not the solution. But nothing like what we have seen in the last year. Two years. Four years. Five or six years. Recent history. And... Amir says this is going on in the other countries as well. It's going on in Israel. It's going on in the other countries. They're not trusting. So COVID-19 aggressively changed worldwide thinking. Made the world eager for somebody with some solutions. And the world's never been more ready for somebody with solutions. But that which restrains must be removed. And I believe the reason why Paul didn't capitalize the uh, he restrainer is because it's not the Holy Spirit. But it is the Holy Spirit, but it's not. I believe the he is us. I believe the church is the reason why, okay, I suspect that Joe Biden probably dreams, dreams of all the evangelical Christians just going away. Because then he would have a free hand. And frankly, it's uh, evangelical Christian believers in Congress and etc. that are keeping them from just doing whatever they want to. Amen. Now it looks like they're having the upper hand, and they are. But they're not just doing anything they want to without being restricted. But can you imagine a world, John Lennon? Imagine a world 
with no Christians. Imagine if every single one of your neighbors was a non-believer. Imagine if every police officer, every elected official, imagine if everybody around you was a non-believer. That's what's coming. When the rapture of the church takes us out of here, there'll be nobody left behind except for those who are ungodly. Now, I don't know whether that, that's not an easy thing to take in, what that would be like. What would they be willing to do? Well, I told you before the election fraud that took place was not new. The election fraud that took place was taken to a next level. There's always been people who cheat. Chicago is famous for voting early, voting often, right? I mean, that's, a, that's Chicago as long as I've been alive. That's their reputation. So there's been cheaters always, but the moral level of the nation has sunk to the level where in the last election, people across the board were willing to do things wrong that they wouldn't have done 20 years ago, 50 years ago. And so that opened up, we're, we're coming to the end of this thing, and it's like it's building but it's not unrestrained. The Holy Spirit and the church are in the way of what? What exactly are we in the way of? Well, it's that mystery of iniquity in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. The mystery of iniquity. So what is the mystery of iniquity? Huh. As far as I can tell, the mystery is that God lets it go on. Why? Why does he let it go on? Well, there's reasons and discussions and answers for that, but it is going on and God does allow it. Mm -hmm. But of course, from God's perspective, nobody's getting away with anything. He lives outside time and space. And for example, when I say, well, God, why don't you do something about that pedophile that's doing that thing to that child? And God says, what are you talking about? I did. I haven't got to that point yet. That judgment's going to take place. And it's going to be hell. Yep. Figuratively and literally, it's going to be hell when that pedophile has to pay for what he did. So you get the picture. The mystery of iniquity is working. And we're restraining that to some extent. So I want to give you a picture Zechariah chapter 5, the whole of Zechariah chapter 5 is the most amazing prophecy, maybe the hardest to understand prophecy in the Bible, but let's take a shot at it. So I just kind of set it up for you. The first, the first half of chapter 5 is told, and then it's kind of retold in the second half. So in the first half, uh, Zechariah is told, then I lifted up, or he said, then I lifted up uh, my eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. Okay, a flying roll. You got a roll that's got wings, it's flying. Wouldn't that be a bizarre thing to see? A flying roll. Well, it's a scroll. It's the scripture. Looked, and behold, a flying, a flying roll. And he said unto me, what do you see? And he answered, I see a flying roll, the length thereof 20 cubits and the breadth thereof 10 cubits. And I believe that's the same ratio as the tabernacle, the Old Testament tabernacle. Then said he unto me, this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it. And every one that sweareth shall be cut off on that side according to it. I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief, so that's what was said, those who steal, the thief, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. What that is, is you've got two commandments that is a cryptic way of saying the law, all ten commandments. You've got two commandments, and that, that says, so the commandments. So the flying scroll, the flying roll, is the word of God. 
And the word of God is going to judge this world. Everything Jesus said that's in that book is going to come to pass. Amen. Okay? So that's the setup. Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes and see what is this that goeth forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is an ephah, or a basket, that goeth forth. He said, moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. Okay. So ephah is a measure. That, that was an Old Testament measure. When you bought wheat or whatever you bought, it was measured. Ephah is a measure. So God has measured the evil that's going on. He knows it. He knows it. And so this, this measure of evil has this woman in it. Now, just note for yourself, anytime a woman is used prophetically or symbolically in Scripture, it is a religious authority either out of place or doing the wrong thing. Whenever you see a woman used prophetically or symbolically, she is a religious authority, either out of place or doing the wrong thing. For example, there is a whore that rides a beast in Revelation 17. Okay, that's a religious authority. That's going to be, I'm convinced, it's going to be the Catholic Church. That's going to be the whore that sits on the beast. So we have this woman who's in this basket this measure. And he said, this is wickedness. Okay, so that's what the basket is. That's what this woman in the basket is. It's wickedness. And he cast the lead in the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. Then lifted I up my eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women. Now, I don't know what that means. You put in one woman, but then out comes two. I don't, I don't know what that means. There's an answer. Came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, and they had wings like uh, the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the ephah between earth and heaven. Then said I to the angel that talked with me, Whither do they bear the ephah? And he said to me, To build it and house in the land of Shinar, the place of Nimrod, the place of that giant statue in Daniel, the place of the Antichrist, the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. So, I believe, could be wrong, I believe this woman in this ephah is in the land the land, Israel. But there's coming a day when this unclean animal, a stork, is going to be able to move that to the land of Shinar. Now that's what's going to happen. I don't have a clue what that means. Other than Babylon is going to rise. The power of Babylon is going to be in the land of Shinar. There's going to be a world economic power known as Babylon and a religious power and a political power. And it's going to have its base in Shinar. The great question, is that literally in uh, Iraq, the land of Shinar, or is that symbolic of a world system? Or both? Maybe it's both. If it's going to be literally in Iraq, they need to get underway with it. So, if I'm thinking right about that, that means we're going to see Islam begin to grow and rise to a power there in the land of Shinar in Iraq. Okay, so there's all that. And that's worthy of uh, two or three weeks of study. Have you got any question about that before we move on? That is wickedness. That's going to be measured by God. He's going to know what wickedness is. He, he, Got it measured. And it's going to be sealed 
The lead talent was placed on that woman. She, she's not free to do what she wants to now. But there's going to be a day when it's going to break forth and wickedness is going to be freed. That's the rapture of the church and this coming Antichrist in the tribulation time. So let's move on. I want you to... So the wickedness is growing in the world. We know that. It's obvious. It's growing by leaps and bounds. Growing in a way that it never has before. Taking it to a level I don't think it's ever seen. I want you to see... You know, we have the finest government money can buy. Now think about what that means. We've got the finest government money can buy. They're throwing your money out the window like it was Monopoly money. Amen. Watch what your State Department is doing for you. The Department of State is committed to promoting the freedom, dignity, and equality of all people, including LGBTQI persons. Starting today, you are no longer required to submit medical certification if you wish to change the gender marker on your passport. You can simply select male or female on the application form. It gets better. Even if the gender you identify with does not match the gender on your birth certificate or other documents. For the moment, only male or female gender markers are available. But I'm pleased to announce the department has begun moving toward adding a gender marker for non-binary, intersex, and gender non-conforming persons. The process of adding a gender marker is complex and will take time. We are committed to getting this right. We will be coordinating with other government agencies to ensure as smooth a travel experience as possible for all U.S. citizens, regardless of... If you've been vaccinated. We will provide updates and let you know when this new gender marker becomes available on our website, travel.state.gov. Bill Canning righteous people are becoming worn out, almost numb, to the daily bombardment of one aberration after another. And maybe Noah felt this way during his time, and he probably pleaded with people in his day to stop the madness. But where is this going? Oh, Jan, obviously what we are all concerned about is where is it going with the children? Yes, and What yeah. you're doing with the young children, whether it's this gender confusion thing, there's going to be three divisive issues facing schools going into the fall. Number one is going to be what we've been talking about with the vaccine and mask mandates. Number two is the critical race theory. And number three is this transgenderism education. I mean, our church is in Loudoun County. It's been on the front page of newspapers throughout the country. Yes, it has. Church members has been on the front line. He said, I will not, as a Christian, go with this pronoun language you're going to be forcing on me because of my faith. You can't even begin to comprehend this, but I think that what really perplexes us more than anything else is what they're doing with the children, whether it's the transgender, LGBTQ education in the grade schools and elementary schools, and also this vaccine mask thing. Fauci mentioned that he wants kids two years old and plus to wear masks going into the new school year. That So, Dr. Chuck Missler, how many of you are familiar with him? Good guy. He's with the Lord now. So I ripped this off from him, just to give credit where credit's due. He went through uh, the names of the New Testament and the Old Testament, we'll see in just a moment, uh, the names of this coming evil one who's going to take this wickedness to the next level. Abaddon, Apollyon, some of you might be familiar with some organizations who use those titles as if they were a good thing. The Antichrist or the Pseudo-Christ, False Prophet, we know these, the Lawless One, Man of Sin, the one who comes in his own name. That's interesting. He comes in his own name. Son of Perdition that we talked about, the Son of Hell last week, and then there's a lot of... So my point to show you this was... This guy is talked about all over Scripture. Aside from Christ, I don't suppose there's any other one person talked about as much as the Antichrist. Amen. And yet, and I don't mean to be demeaning or pick on anybody, but just to pluck a figure out of the air like liberals do, uh, I'll bet there's not one in 50 preachers that ever even utter one of the names or talks about the Antichrist. 
Well, what's that tell you about the state of the church in America? Okay, so we talked about AI and aliens a couple of weeks ago because this is all going to feed into this. I'm not going to go back over all that, but I do want to talk a little bit about the artificial intelligence. It's getting intelligencer. Did I share this with you last week? I didn't no. think I did. So AI <coughs> enabled this guy who lost his wife, his girlfriend, I'm sorry, Grieving man uses AI site to chat with his dead girlfriend. So without reading all of it, let me tell you what they did. So uh, let me explain what AI is. AI is just a mass of huge amounts of data and supercomputer capabilities that we've got now, almost in our phones, to be able to take that information and do something with it. So what this AI did, this, this, these people set up this, uh, AI to be able to take all the information from this girl's tweets and Facebook page, everything she put on Facebook, and all those things that she, uh, maybe recordings of her voice, I don't know, and put it together in such a way that this guy was able to have a chat with his wife. And he couldn't tell it from his wife, or his girlfriend, I'm sorry. He couldn't tell it from his girlfriend. Now, that's just weird. I mean, that's over the edge bizarre. I don't, I don't know which is worse, that they would do that or that that guy would be ministered to that way. Anyway, that is what that is. And then AI and T2. Any of you saw Terminator 2? If you didn't, you can go watch it. It's a precursor to things that we're talking about that's coming. So let me give you the gist of it. Facebook, in their research, developed these two algorithms, this artificial intelligence. And they told these two computers, if you will, to, to visualize it, told these two computers to work together on the problem to make communication work more efficiently. Okay, a more efficient way of communication. But what they failed to do, well, so they were watching these two AI working on this problem of making more efficient communication. And all at once there was gibberish. And they thought something had gone wrong. But no, these two computers were talking to each other in gibberish. They developed their own language. They failed to put in the software, this needs to be done in English so we can see what you're saying. And so they developed these two AI on their own, developed their own language. So, my word, there's a lot to be said. We're going to stop here because our time.